brand names are strange things, some over time become a descriptive of the product itself, as when a person asks for a Kleenex when they meet a tissue. The plastic bandage for a minor wound is often called a Band-Aid, itself a brand name trademarked by Johnson & Johnson. Nobody ever asks for a Curad when they need a bandage. Some brand names become associated, however unjustly with controversy. Others have links to the past which were, and in some cases are controversial. The goal of all brand names is the same. A vendor wants his product or business so well known to the public that the mention of the name is forever linked with what they sell. As public sentiments change over time, the name's impact on the public changes as well. Some fabled sports teams' names, which are brand names as well, are disappearing, under pressure from various advocates. For example, in 2022 the former Cleveland Indians will play under the new name of the Cleveland Guardians. Millions of products labeled with nicknames known to refer to the Indians, such as the tribe and the Wahoos, along with depictions of Chief Wahoo were instantly orphaned, other brand names succumb to changing views about what constitutes racism, such as Aunt Jemima, Uncle Ben's, Eskimo Pie and the Washington Redskins. Presumably few giants exist to protest the stereotypical depiction of them as jolly and green. Anyway here are the histories of some storied brand names, and how they came to be. A soft drink name for illicit whiskey. During Prohibition, bootleggers and organized crime figures obtained their illicit liquor from numerous sources, some they simply manufactured in hidden facilities. Some they smuggled in from Canada, Europe, Cuba, and Mexico. In the eastern United States they purchased it from distillers in the Appalachian Hills and Valleys, where moonshiners have distilled whiskey since the earliest days of the Republic. They called the whiskey by several names, including Moonshine White Lightning, and Mountain Dew not being barrel-aged, Mountain Dew gained the reputation of being a harsh beverage, far from a smooth sipping whiskey. It required mixers to make it palatable, for any but the most dedicated whiskey drinker, the relative harshness of American whiskeys continued for decades after repeal of Prohibition, and Americans often took their whiskey with mixers. Such was the case with two bottlers in Knoxville, Tennessee in the late 1930s. Ally and Barney Hartman found it difficult to obtain their preferred mixer in eastern Tennessee, and decided to create their own. Their concoction originally appeared locally in the late 1940s. In 1961 Virginia's Tip Corporation bought the rights to the beverage and its name Mountain Dew and launched it nationally. Its advertising featured a stereotyped hillbilly, Complete with shooting iron and jug, highly caffeinated and sweetened with high fructose corn syrup, Mountain Dew became extremely popular, particularly in its birthland of the South. Owned by PepsiCo since the mid-1960s, Mountain Dew eventually expanded to a variety of flavors and related beverages. Originally developed as a mixer for alcoholic beverages, and named for illegal whiskey, it remains highly popular especially among the young. A major American sport is linked with Prohibition and Moonshine as well, as noted, illicit distilling in America is as old as the nation itself, so are government efforts to suppress the practice. One of the first crises faced by the federal government under the Constitution was an insurrection by Pennsylvania distillers over taxes on their whiskey. The Whiskey Rebellion in the early 1790s began a continuing battle between illicit distillers and the government's attempts to confiscate their untaxed products. A prohibition specially modified automobiles were used to deliver moonshine to customers. The cars were modified to increase power speed, handling and carrying capacity. Their drivers called the practice run and shine, and before long bragging rights led to them racing each other, usually in the South, moonshine retained its popularity post-prohibition in many of the southern states, where dry counties continued to ban liquor for decades. In 1948, after extended talks with drivers, track owners, promoters and potential sponsors, Bill France Sr. announced the formation of the National Association for Stock Car Racing, which uses the brand name NASCAR. Many of the more successful early drivers were moonshine runners. Then and now, throughout NASCAR's history, very little of the vehicles involved was stock. Modifications for performance and safety have always been part of its program. Even in its strictly stock series of the late 1940s, drivers modified their cars, often using old bootlegging techniques, to gain an edge over their rivals' drivers, rather than the revenuers. NASCAR's direct links to illegal moonshining and its distribution are well known, and even exploited from time to time. It is also deeply enmeshed with the aforementioned Mountain Dew, two famed American brand names born out of criminal activities. The restaurant chain with the unfortunate name. 
In 1957, entrepreneurs Sam Battistone Sr. and Newell Bonnet opened a restaurant in Santa Barbara, California. They named their establishment by creating a portmanteau of their own names, Sam and Bo. The new restaurant became Samba's. As they expanded through franchising, the restaurant's name caused it to be linked to a popular children's book of the time, The Story of Little Black Samba. In the story, a young Indian boy avoids being eaten by tigers, by giving them his clothes and an umbrella. The vain tigers argue over which is more resplendent, and they chase each other around a tree until they melt themselves into ghee. Ghee is a clarified butter and a staple of Indian cuisine. Samba's mother uses the ghee to make pancakes. The restaurateurs exploited the association with decor in the restaurants depicting the story and characters in the book. By the 1970s the book and the restaurant were under considerable protest over the racial overtones depicted in each. Samba came to be considered a pejorative for black males. Though the company had grown to over 1,100 restaurants its financial situation was poor. Protests and boycotts by activists over its name simply added to the financial pressure. Attempts to change both its name and the appearance of its restaurants were of no avail. Bankruptcy came in 1981, some of the stores became Denny's. Others became Baker's Square restaurants. The last Samba is the original restaurant in Santa Barbara, continued to operate under that name until 2020. Pressure by activists that summer led to a change and the brand name Samba has vanished from the American landscape. The story of Little Black Samba, including numerous revisions, name changes and criticism, remains available though many American stores refuse to carry it. A drug which was once a brand name. Although other chemists had synthesized diamorphine in the 1870s, it took those working for the German drug giant Bayer to find a market for the drug. Felix Hoffman, working for Bayer two decades later, was attempting to produce codeine from morphine when he synthesized diacetylmorphine. The new drug was up to twice as potent as morphine itself. Bayer's researchers named the new drug and trademarked the name as heroin. In 1895 they began marketing heroin aggressively in Europe and in the United States. They claimed the new product was non-addictive, and could thus be used as an alternative to morphine to control pain. They also touted its superiority as a cough syrup. For several years the drug was available in the United States without a prescription, and Bayer advertised it in catalogs, magazines, newspapers, and in store displays. Changes to American law made heroin available only by prescription in 1914's Harrison Narcotics Tax Act. In 1924 the United States banned it completely but and the trademark heroin was no longer held by Bayer. The German company lost it, along with several other trademarks and brand names, under the provisions of the Treaty of Versailles which ended the First World War. Until the imposition of that treaty, aspirin was another brand name for a drug developed and marketed by Bayer. Heroin as a brand name was relatively short-lived, but as a societal issue, it has remained problematic for over a century. Bayer's claims of its non-addictive properties were long ago proved false, and heroin and other opioid addictions claim thousands of lives each year. Under U.S. federal law it can be possessed only by those with a Drug Enforcement Agency, DEA, license. The cereal intended to reduce the libido. John Harvey Kellogg, a Seventh-day Adventist advocated a vegetarian diet, daily exercise total avoidance of the sins of alcohol and tobacco, and the reduction of sexual stimulation. In his view a bland diet was essential to those worthy goals. As chief medical officer of the Battle Creek Sanitarium, he operated an experimental kitchen. Their numerous new recipes and foods were developed by sanitarium staff. Among them were Kellogg's toasted corn flakes. Kellogg disagreed with his brother, Will Keith Kellogg over marketing the cereal. W.K. obtained the rights to the product, opened the Battle Creek Toasted Corn Flake Company, and later changed the name to Kellogg Toasted Corn Flake Company in 1909. W.K. was not as open-minded as his brother. When John allowed a visitor, C.W. Post observed the manufacturer of corn flakes, Post left to start his own company, which eventually became General Foods. The brothers also argued over the addition of sugar to the product. John wanted the cereal to decrease stimulation and believed sugar to do the opposite. W.K. Kellogg's company became international in his lifetime. Kellogg's as a brand name arose from the dispute between two brothers. Today it is among the most recognizable brands in the world, and also owns other famous brands including Pringles, Eggo, and Nutrigrain, among many others. Through subsidiaries the company markets yogurt. That's singularly appropriate since John Harvey Kellogg advocated the consumption of a pint of yogurt following a water enema. A half pint was to be taken orally, 
followed by a half pint by a yet another enema. The People's Car in Pre-World War II Germany It is a widespread myth that Adolf Hitler's leadership led to the construction of the German Autobahn. Construction of the highways began in the 1920s during the Weimar Republic, nor were they intended to be used primarily by the military, the Wehrmacht moved men and materials long distances by train. But the Nazi leadership enthusiastically endorsed construction when they came to power in 1933. Hitler envisioned the new highways, allowing German citizens to move about freely, for work and for leisure. To do that a new automobile was needed. Hitler wanted a car which was simple, low maintenance, and affordable, much like Henry Ford's, whom Hitler greatly admired, Model T had been. He directed Ferdinand Porsche to develop such a car, and the automotive engineer and pioneer went to work. It was Der Fuhrer who insisted the car be air-cooled, and that it could transport two adults and three children at Autobahn speeds. Porsche complied. Numerous pre-production models appeared, before Germany invaded Poland in 1939. In 1938 a factory and a supporting factory town were built to produce Volkswagens. About 200 or so of the cars were built before the war began and the factory shifted to wartime production for the Wehrmacht. Post-war with primarily British support, the factory returned to production of the Volkswagen, People's Car, Vietel. Production for civilian consumption resumed in 1947. By 1972 the Volkswagen Beetle was arguably the most easily recognizable automobile in the world. It could carry two adults and three children, if they were small, was air-cooled, affordable to purchase and simple to maintain. Volkswagen became one of the world's largest automobile manufacturers and one of the most well-known brand names. In the 1960s their advertising earned numerous awards through poking fun at themselves and the seemingly ubiquitous Beetle. The tonic which became a well-known carbonated soft drink around the world. John Stith Pemberton created a tonic in the 1860s. He used a wine extracted from coca leaves, cola nuts and other ingredients to concoct a tonic which included alcohol, caffeine and cocaine. That it served as a stimulant is unsurprising. Pemberton called the tonic Pemberton's French wine coca. According to Pemberton the tonic cured headache, stomach ache, fatigue, constipation, morphine addiction and several other ailments. He sold the tonic through his drugstore and mail order. Among his customers was former U.S. President Ulysses S. Grant, who used it to treat his terminal throat cancer in the 1880s. In 1886, the temperance movement succeeded in gaining legislation banning alcohol in Fulton County, Georgia, which included Atlanta. Pemberton was forced to remove the alcohol from his tonic. He needed to find a way to adapt to the new law while retaining his tonic's wondrous powers. The introduction of carbonated water to the tonic's base preparation was an accident and changed Pemberton's marketing plan. The new product, still containing cocaine and caffeine, became a beverage sold at soda fountains. A partner Frank Mason Robinson dubbed the new syrup Coca-Cola. Cocaine remained an ingredient in the beverage until the early 20th century. After its removal, extract of coca leaves remained a flavoring ingredient. Robinson developed the early advertising for the product, and the famed cursive logo was based on Pemberton writing the name in his own hand. Coca-Cola took advantage of the steadily growing dry faction in the United States and marketed itself as a temperance drink, even while it continued to contain cocaine. Its famed logos both Coca-Cola and Coke are routinely listed as among the most well-known in the world. Two brothers created competing shoe companies because they couldn't stand each other. The brothers Dassler, Rudolf and Adolf sons of a shoemaker, started a shoe manufacturing company in Weimar, Germany in 1924. They manufactured primarily sports shoes. In 1936 the brothers persuaded American sprinter Jesse Owens to wear their shoes at the Munich Olympics. Owens won four gold medals in their shoes. Both brothers joined the Nazi party, and following their successful Olympics foray their business boomed. Then World War II came. Manufacturing sports shoes was not a wartime industry. Demand plummeted. Problems between the brothers were exacerbated by wartime demands. Adolf, who was known as Adi, did not get along with his brother's wife, and neither of their wives were particularly fond of each other. After the war ended, the brothers attempted to restore their business, located in the town of Herzogenaurach, about 12 miles from Nuremberg. Their attempt failed. Rudolf had been arrested by the Americans late in the war, and accused of being a member of the Waffen-SS. He was convinced his brother, 
Adi had denounced him to the Allies. Rudolf was released after Adi appeared before a denazification panel convened by the Americans. During his appearances, Rudolf informed the panel that, his brother had led the effort to convert the shoe factory to the manufacture of anti-tank weapons during the war, the rifts between the brothers also divided their extended family, and by late 1947 were totally irreconcilable. In early 1947 the shoe factory, which had been confiscated by the Allies, was returned to Adi's control and he was allowed to resume management of the company. Enraged Rudolf moved across the Aurok River, where the shoe firm had a second factory. Both brothers started new companies in their respective factories. Adolf Dassler used his name for his new company. Adolf Dassler selected his nickname Adi, and the first three letters of his last name to christen his new shoe company Adidas, he hit upon the idea of coloring the reinforcing straps of the sides of the shoes, in a different shade than the rest of the shoe. In March 1949, he trademarked the three-striped logo. Adi concentrated his efforts on the development of football boots and rapidly rebuilding Europe. His Adidas company developed the innovation of screw and spikes for his boots, allowing players to gain superior traction on muddy pitches. Adidas provided spikes of varying lengths, giving the wearer the ability to decide, which were most suitable for prevailing conditions. The spikes also prevented mud from building up on and around the sole. Muddy boots were heavier and more fatiguing for the wearer. Exposure on the football fields and the three-stripe logo gave Adidas favorable publicity. The company grew rapidly. In 1952 Adidas settled a dispute with a Finnish company, which had a similar three-stripe logo. Adidas claimed they had invented it, though the Finnish company Carhu Sports produced pairs of shoes from the 1940s which preceded Adidas' use of the logo. To settle the issue, Adidas purchased the logo for two bottles of whiskey and cash, meanwhile a bitter rivalry emerged with a shoe factory across the river, operated by Rudolf. Both brothers paid athletes to wear their shoes at football matches, track and field meets, and other sporting events. In the 1960 Summer Olympics, Armin Hari won the gold medal for the 100 meters. Before stepping on the podium, he changed his shoes from the pair he wore for the race to a pair of Adidas, hoping to be paid for endorsing them. Adi refused payment. Rudolf Dassler used an animal for his company name and logo. Across the Aurok River, Rudolf used his share of the former Dassler Brothers shoe factory to start his own company. He initially named it Ruda using the first two letters of his first and last names. His intent was to dethrone his younger brother as the leading provider of shoes to European footballers and track and field athletes. In 1948 Rudolf changed the name of his new company, calling it Puma Shoe Fabric Rudolf Dassler. For a logo, he selected a leaping puma, Quechua for cougar, and for his shoe markings he selected a square with a large cat in a leaping pose and the letter D. The well-known strip along the side of the shoe did not appear until 1958, by then Adi and Rudolf had carried their rivalry, and their feud, to dimensions well known in rebuilding West Germany, and the rest of Europe. Since Adidas and Puma both manufactured their shoes in the same town, it soon became a divisive issue among its citizens. Herzogenaurak adopted the nickname the town of Bentnex, as people looked down to see which brand of shoes others wore. During Rudolf's lifetime, Puma remained a small, regional company, with his focus on beating his brother in competitions, rather than on bottom line. After his death, his sons Gert and Armin ran the company until 1989, and it was they who moved it into multinational corporation manufacturing shoes, clothing, sportswear, accessories and sports equipment. The bitter rivalry between two brothers, who never reconciled, created not one but two of the largest sports-oriented companies in the world. Both are still headquartered in Herzogenaurach, Germany, though both have other manufacturing facilities at sites around the world. The ball bearing manufacturer, which became a major automobile company. Svenska Kulliger Fabriken, which is Swedish for Swedish ball bearing factory, was founded in 1907 in Gothenburg. During the Industrial Revolution, ball bearings were a critical component in machinery of all types, and the company, which operated under the name SKF, became one of the largest manufacturers of ball bearings, as well as seals and lubrication components. In 1911, SKF trademarked the name Volvo intending to use it on their ball bearings. The decision was appropriate. Volvo is a conjugation of the Latin verb volvere, and translates to English as I roll. The decision to use it for bearings was later overturned. SKF continued to identify their bearings, 
and other products with their initials rather than the new name, though they retained its trademark. Then in 1924, an SKF sales executive named Asar Gabrielson decided to develop an automobile. Cars from less rigorous climates encountered difficulties operating in the harsh Swedish winter. With the support of his employer, Gabrielson built and tested several prototypes. In 1927 the first production car designated an of and bearing the name Volvo appeared. Of stood for Oppen von meaning open carriage, and the four indicated it was equipped with a four-cylinder engine. An open car may not seem wise given the temperatures of a Swedish winter, but the car was soon supported with a closed version, the PV4. Gabrielsson and his partner selected the already trademarked name because SKF already owned it, and I roll supported their shared belief the car could operate successfully regardless of weather and road conditions. Volvo is by no means the only automobile company to use Latin for its name. Audi is derived from Adir, Latin for to listen. The American beer which borrowed its brand name. In 1876, St. Louis brewer Adolphus Bush created a new beer in his brewery. Styling it a bohemian-style lager, Bush named the new beverage Budweiser. Over the years it came to be called the King of Beers, by its brewer and their advertisers. At that time Budweiss was the Germanized name of a town in Bohemia, now located in the Czech Republic. Budweiser itself means of Budweiss. Adolphus Bush marketed the beer aggressively, and the company still does. But there is a problem with the brand name which is one of America's most iconic. Since the 13th century, a beer named Budweiser has been brewed in the Pilsen region of Bohemia, now in the Czech Republic, Adolphus Bush appropriated the name. He didn't stop there. The Bohemian version of Budweiser was called the Beer of Kings, since the 1600s. Bush's trespass there is self-evident. Those who taste both beers will find they have little in common, other than the shared name. Since the breakup of Czechoslovakia and the creation of the Czech Republic, the original owner of the name Budweiser has called their beer by the Czech translation. The Budweiser Budwar, the fourth largest brewery in the Czech Republic, and Anheuser-Busch have engaged in trademark disputes since the early 20th century. As of 2010, Anheuser-Busch can only use the abbreviation Bud when selling its Budweiser products in the European Union. The Czech version is sold in North America, Brazil, and other nations to which it is exported as Czechver. It is also sold under that name in the Philippines. Sales of the Czech breweries' products have expanded steadily in the past 30 years. Budweiser's have declined. The brand name created from a fictional housewife. In 1921, the Washburn Crosby Company, later one of the founding companies of General Mills, held a contest in the Saturday Evening Post, they were seeking a character to use when addressing questions or concerns regarding their products. A fictional American housewife and cooking expert was the result. She was given the last name Crocker, borrowed from Washburn Crosby executive William Crocker. Her first name Betty came from the belief of the all-male executives of the firm, that it sounded like the all-American girl next door. By 1924 Betty had a radio program, the Betty Crocker Cooking School of the Air, voiced by actress Marjorie Houston. Betty's image created in 1921, adapted over the years to reflect changing American values and images of women, several actresses and radio personalities provided her voice over the ensuing decades. Betty moved to television in 1949, appearing on programs hosted by other celebrities, including George and Gracie Burns. She eventually acquired her own program, the Betty Crocker star matinee portrayed by Adelaide Hawley. Fortune magazine named her the second most popular woman in America in 1945, following Eleanor Roosevelt. Later that same year Fortune identified her as a fraud. Evidently they had believed she was real. Holly also portrayed Betty Crocker in the first color commercial ever aired by CBS, during which she baked a cake. In the 20th century, she became bilingual, with her many cookbooks appearing in Spanish and directions on her product labels provided in Spanish and English. General Mills commissioned an official portrait for Betty in 1936, and updated it numerous times in the years since. She was not a real person nor even based on one, though people still question General Mills over her true identity in the 21st century. The Imitation Cookie which became number one. In 1912 executives of the National Biscuit Company had a problem, rival Sunshine Biscuit dominated the market with a chocolate sandwich cookie, two wafers filled with cream, which they called Hydrox. Bakers and chemists got to work, and in March they introduced a new cookie which was clearly an imitation of Hydrox. National Biscuit, 
which later became Nabisco, called their new cookie the Oreo Biscuit. The source of the name Oreo is uncertain, and many theories abound including it was derived from Latin, from French or from an abbreviation for appetite stimulants. Orexigenics stimulate the appetite and could be a cause for reaching for one Oreo after the other, a fairly common practice, though Hydrox supporters claim their cookie was both creamier in its filling and crunchier in its cookies, Oreo gradually took over. As of 2021, Oreo branded cookies are the number one cookie in terms of sales in the world. They can be found on store shelves in over 100 countries. They are produced by several different companies, Nabisco in the United States, Cadbury in the United Kingdom and others around the world. Born as an imitation, Oreo has led to its own imitators, including Newman Oss, the Finnish Domino and brand names operated by various grocery chains. For those interested, the basic Oreo cookie contains about 45 calories more or less. For variations, calorie count varies but there is no such thing as diet Oreos. Oreo thin smaller versions of the original are made from the same recipe. Hydrox the original chocolate sandwich cookie have been in and out of production and as of this writing can be found in limited locations in the United States. The car brand brought down by a drug sting. John DeLorean was an experienced automotive engineer well backed with capital. When he started the DeLorean Motor Company in 1975, he envisioned a high-performance, stainless steel-bodied automobile, but first he needed a place to produce it. With significant financial support from the British government, as well as numerous celebrities and American investors, DeLorean built a factory to produce his cars near Belfast, Northern Ireland. Production began in 1981, two years behind schedule and significantly over budget. The car did not sell well. Concerns over quality of finish a lack of performance, higher than expected costs, and lack of dealer support kept sales well below the break-even point. Then consumers learned the company's founder, John DeLorean, was the target of a sting operation. The FBI, the DEA and the British government all presented evidence DeLorean planned to smuggle $24 million in cocaine into the United States. Despite videotaped evidence clearly depicting DeLorean discussing the deal with undercover agents, he was acquitted. His attorneys demonstrated entrapment. DeLorean later blamed the entrapment for the collapse of his company, though in fact, the company was already hopelessly in debt, and there was no demand for his products. If not for the exposure in the Back to the Future film trilogy, the DeLorean would be all but forgotten today. Various automotive enthusiasts have tried to elevate interest in the brand with little success. Of the estimated 9,000 cars built in the early 1980s, about 6,500 are believed to still be drivable, and several support groups have evolved around it in the United States. Michael J. Fox's films restored the vehicle's panache, but to date, nothing has restored what DeLorean once claimed as demand for his car. John DeLorean died in 2005, still believing in the potential success of DeLorean Motors. The product shill who created a brand name. Ron Popeil initially worked as a salesman and presenter of products invented by his father, Samuel Popeil. In 1964 he founded Ronco, a brand which quickly became known through the use of infomercials. Ronco brought consumers such products as the Veg Omatic, the Chop Omatic, the Papile Pocket Fisherman, biggest fishing invention since the hook, and the inspired inside the shell egg scrambler. Mr. Microphone, which allowed the user to hear him or herself over a nearby radio, encouraged potential singing careers. For those losing their hair, Ronco offered GLH9. Bald spots and thinning hair were replaced by the promised great-looking hair applied from an aerosol can. Papile became an early target of comedians poking fun at his selling style, including Johnny Carson and Dan Aykroyd. The latter demonstrated the basso matic whirling a whole fish in a blender to produce a beverage, on Saturday Night Live. To be fair, some Ronco products lived up to their promise, including the Showtime rotisserie oven Set It and Forget It, and its variations. But most never overcame the carnival sideshow reputation, they gained through the infomercials. Some were simply cheesy. The egg scrambler was simply a needle which penetrated the shell and whipped around, powered by batteries. The dial omatic offered to complement the veg omatic was a reconfigured kitchen mandolin. Ron Papile died in July 2021, having seen his company, Ronco, enter bankruptcy and liquidate three years earlier. But there's more. Ronco continues to maintain an online presence after having been acquired by H.D. Schulman International Trading. Some of the original products are thus still available, and most of the infomercials can be viewed online. The military vehicle which launched a major corporation. 
In the late 1930s, the U.S. Army needed a new vehicle for transportation and reconnaissance. They specified the vehicle should be four-wheel drive, inexpensive to purchase and maintain, able to reach speeds of 50 miles per hour. The Army also demanded a working prototype in just seven weeks. Detroit's Bantam Car Company complied. In reward, the Army gave the Bantam plans to both Ford and Toledo, Ohio's Willys Overland, believing Bantam incapable of meeting demand for the new vehicle. Bantam later manufactured a small number of the vehicles, most of which went to Britain under lend lease. The Bantam design, with minimal alterations, the famed grille design came from Ford, became the near legendary Jeep. Jeep later became a major brand name in SUVs and off road vehicles. But the origin of its name, usually attributed to a slurring of the initials GP, for general purpose vehicle, is inaccurate. During the First World War, both vehicles and new recruits were referred to as Jeeps. And while the Army did designate the car as a GPW, G referred to government, P to wheelbase, and W to Willys, its engine manufacturer. The Army Air Corps and later Air Forces referred to the Link Trainer Simulator as a Jeep. The U.S. Navy's escort carriers of World War II were called Jeep carriers by the men who crewed them. By World War II, the term Jeep referred to small vehicles, small aircraft, gadgets, and any other equipment the GIs chose to honor with it. Willys Overland tried to trademark the name for its Bantam-designed car in 1943, though Bantam disputed it and several years of legal battles ensued. In 1945 Willys produced the first civilian Jeep, designating it the Willys CJ, Civilian Jeep. Willys finally acquired the trademark Jeep in 1950. The rubber substitute which became an internationally beloved toy, in 1941 and 1942, the Japanese Army and Navy overran Southeast Asia, and the Dutch and British Pacific possessions which produced most of the world's rubber, in the United States, shortages of rubber made tires the first consumer product subject to rationing. Gasoline was also rationed, not because of a shortage of petroleum, but instead as a means to preserve tires. Research into synthetic substitutes for natural rubber intensified during the war. Researchers at two American companies, Dow Corning and General Electric, independently discovered a mixture of silicone oil and boric acid, which produced a compound with some, but unfortunately not all, of the characteristics of rubber. It could stretch, bounce and resist heat, but it could not harden to the point it could be used as a seal or as tires. Still researchers explored other uses for the product during the war years, and immediately followed its conclusion. In 1949 a toy seller and a marketing consultant, Ruth Fallgutter and Peter Hodgson respectively, began selling the compound. When Fallgutter gave up on the product, Hodgson bought the production rights from General Electric, he named the compound Silly Putty, packed it in plastic eggs, and promoted it heavily during the Easter season in 1950. In August a reporter for the New Yorker magazine discovered Silly Putty in a bookstore, his article describing Silly Putty and the amusements it offered caused sales to skyrocket. In 1961 Silly Putty was introduced in the Soviet Union, where it became a huge hit. Primarily sold as a toy, the compound has other uses. Apollo astronauts used it to hold tools in place while in zero gravity. Therapists use it to help patients recover from hand injuries. In the 21st century, it is still marketed as a toy usually packed in a plastic egg. An inept cook led to the invention of the adhesive bandage. Earl Dixon was newly married in 1920, his wife Josephine, exhibited enthusiasm for her new duties as a housewife, but in the kitchen demonstrated a certain lack of aptitude. Earl often came home to find his dinner prepared, but his wife bearing a new cut, or scrape or burn as a result of her efforts. What was worse was Josephine often experienced difficulties bandaging the wound, being alone at the time. Earl while presumably expressing sympathy to his bride for her difficulties, decided to at least help her solve the problem of covering the wounds. He took adhesive tape and affixed cotton pads at intervals, covered the pads with crinoline, and cut them into ready-made bandages. When they proved successful as Josephine needed them, Earl decided to take the idea to his employer. Earl worked for Johnson & Johnson in Highland Park, New Jersey. Johnson & Johnson developed the idea of adhesive bandages, and marketed them under the trademark Band-Aid. Other companies followed in the marketing of adhesive bandages, until scores even hundreds of companies sold them under various names but they became known almost universally as band-aids, an example of a trademark becoming genericized. Other examples include Kleenex for a facial tissue or Xerox for a photocopy.
Earl Dixon eventually rose to a vice president position with Johnson & Johnson. He retired in 1957. By then over 1.5 billion adhesive bandages were sold annually. In 1951 Johnson & Johnson introduced decorated bandages. Since then Johnson & Johnson alone has sold over 100 billion adhesive bandages of all types under the Band-Aid trademark, inspired by a young housewife with an unfortunate tendency to hurt herself in her kitchen. The airline name that appears to be misspelled. In the English language, when a word begins with the letter Q it is almost invariably followed by the letter U, there are a few exceptions, all of them having entered limited English usage from Asian or Middle Eastern cultures. Another notable exception is the brand name for the world's third oldest airline, the flag carrier for Australia. Qantas began operations as a commercial air carrier in 1921. Though it is a frequently repeated myth the airline has never had a fatal accident, its safety record is nonetheless admirable. It has suffered no passenger fatalities in over 70 years as of this writing, and has often been designated as the world's safest airline. But what about that name? Why is there no you following the Q in the name of one of the symbols of Australia, where English is the dominant language? Qantas, like many brand names, is an acronym. The original name of the airline which evolved into today's Qantas was the Queensland and Northern Territories Aerial Services. Using an acronym for a brand name is common. Some examples include 3M Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, CVS, Consumer Value Stores, M&M, Mars and Murray, and Nerf, non-expandable recreational foam before spam became a descriptive for frustrating email and text messages. It was an acronym for shoulder of pork and meat under the brand name spam. And Pam Cooking Spray's name is simply an acronym making a descriptive statement of its origins. It stands for product of Arthur Meyerhoff.